All right, so everybody remembers Mira Mirati, I'm sure. She's the ex OpenAI CTO, Chief Technology Officer, and her name kept popping up in that whole OpenAI drama. She was one of the key players last November while Sam Altman got fired for three days, came back, the whole power struggle with the board. And recently, Mira Mirati decided to leave OpenAI. In the last video where we covered that, I said expect to see her announce that she's on some other team, on some other project, either of her own making or scooped up by one of the big existing organizations. But that's going to happen pretty quickly. But I got to say, this happened even faster than I anticipated. So today we know that Mira Mirati is building something new and she's not doing it alone. She's bringing some heavy hitters with her, some serious AI talent. So what does this all mean for the future of AI? Why do we even care? The important thing to understand is it's not just a couple of folks leaving OpenAI here and there. This is more than just sort of your normal employee turnover. OpenAI seems to be facing real competition, not just from the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, those guys are always a factor, but also from smaller startups, many founded by ex-OpenAI folks. It's like everyone's suddenly realizing the potential of AI and they're all jumping into the game, trying to poach the best talent. So let's talk about some of these big names that have left OpenAI recently. We have Miana Chen, Bard Zalf, and Luke Metz. That's quite a lineup, and these aren't just any employees. Chen, for example, led launches for some pretty major products. She was evolved with GPT-4.0 and those O1 reasoning models everyone has been talking about. She was interestingly also behind the advanced voice mode. If you haven't had a chance to try that stuff, it's pretty impressive. It's available on the desktop now. I actually spun it up as I was playing Factorio so I can ask it questions about the game and have it kind of guide me through it a little bit. It did pretty well. So what is it about Chan's background that makes her such a valuable asset? One thing that stands out is her focus on post-training. You know how AI models are first trained on massive amounts of data? That's the foundation. That's how they learn. But post-training is what comes after that. It's about specializing those models for specific tasks. It's like fine-tuning them, making sure that they can actually do something useful. Also, it's ensuring the output is high quality, reliable, and accurate. But why is post-training becoming so important now? Well, it's all about where we are in the evolution of AI. The initial phase, the pre-training phase, is starting to hit a wall. The gains aren't coming as easily as they used to. And now, by the way, that's kind of been the recent kind of talk around the campfire. We don't have confirmation that this is true yet. There's some buzz that OpenAI and Google, there's some leaks from those two companies saying that the next generation of AI models, I mean, they're going to be better, but it's not going to be this insane leap. But there's been a little bit of a slowdown. But whatever the case, a bigger and bigger emphasis is now shifting to the post-training phase. Instead of just making these models bigger and better, we want to make them smarter and more specialized. That's the idea, and that's where someone like Mirati and her team could really shine they could become the go-to experts for post-training, potentially refining any AI model to excel at a specific task. And this, of course, could be a game changer. Now, keep in mind, OpenAI still has tons of talent, tons of resources, and they're working on some really exciting projects like the O1 reasoning models that's generating a lot of buzz. The idea here with those models is that they can actually use more compute time. They take more time to think through a problem which could lead to some really significant improvements. OpenAI is hoping to release the full version by the end of the year, and it will be interesting to see what it can do, the actual full O1 model. But what about Murati's team? Do we have any clues about what they're planning? That's currently still an open question. Will they try to build their own foundation models from scratch, or maybe they'll focus on refining existing ones? Either way, funding is going to be a major factor. Now, of course, other AI companies are attracting massive investments these days. One company that's mentioned is Trider. They just raised 200 million. That's a lot of money flowing to the space. We have Ilya Sutskar company that's now, I believe, valued at over a billion dollars. So will Murati be able to secure similar funding for her venture? Well, that's where her experience and the expertise of her team will come in. Now, like I said, they got a pretty impressive track record. If investors are betting big on AI, Murati and her team are likely to be 
very attractive. So it sounds like we could be on the verge of an AI funding boom. It's definitely a possibility, and that raises some interesting questions about OpenAI. Can they really afford to lose top talent like this, especially as everyone's jumping on the AI bandwagon? Are they going to be relying on kind of the existing model of scaling up with more data, more compute power? Or are they beginning to shift their approach to having these smaller, more specialized models? And to circle back to something I mentioned earlier, this brain drain at OpenAI. So there's been a lot of researchers and employees at OpenAI that have been leaving recently. And it's not just researchers and engineers who are leaving. One of the articles mentioned that Leah Wang also left recently, OpenAI's head of safety systems. That adds a whole other layer to the story. As AI systems become more powerful, the question of safety and ethics becomes more crucial. All right, but let's continue about this idea that pre-training might be hitting a wall. And again, take that with a grain of salt. There's been a few reports on it, a few leaks. But we're not going to know for sure until we kind of see those next generation models. If they come out and they're slightly underwhelming, then we can probably say that, yes, there's truth to this. If the insane run up in capabilities continues, then maybe we still got a while of this boom to ride out. But let's assume that pre-training is hitting a wall and that we've squeezed all the juice that we can out of that initial approach. Or maybe at least it's, it's slowing down. The returns aren't as good. The marginal returns aren't quite as good. Well, post-training is the key to unlocking that sort of next level of AI capabilities. But what does that actually look like in the real world? So Think about healthcare, for example. Imagine an AI that's been specifically trained to analyze medical images, like x-rays and MRIs. Now, this could potentially catch things that human doctors might miss. Or, for example, with language translation, AI can translate not just word for word, but with a deep understanding of cultural nuances. So it wouldn't just be translating words, it would be translating meaning. It could also revolutionize education. So, for example, imagine AI that can personalize the educational content for each student's sort of individual needs. This would be like having a personal tutor for every student. We've known since the 70s or 80s that personal one-on-one -on -one tutoring and mastery learning, meaning that the students can go at their own pace, going a little bit slower if they need more time with a specific subject or accelerating past the things that they find easy, that combining one-on-one -on -one tutoring and mastery learning improves the students' abilities, their sort of performance in school by two standard deviations. This basically makes almost everyone an A student. So taking a model GPT-4, for example, or Claude and doing post-training, that could lead to some pretty incredible advancements in specific fields and specific applications. But let's play devil's advocate for a second. So we've been talking a lot about Murati and her team and all this excitement about post-training. But what if OpenAI adapts? What if OpenAI is skating to the puck, skating in that direction as well? What if they come back even stronger? OpenAI still has a lot going for it. They've got tons of data, they have incredible computing power, and they're working on those O1 reasoning models. And they may continue on this trajectory of doing reasoning models, doing more focus on coding, and uh, they're able to complete tasks on our behalf. And since the beginning, OpenAI talked about them being sort of the base layer of AI. So they build sort of the base layer models, the foundations, and then they would allow all the other companies to sort of build on top of it, to build the actual applications, the actual companies that then utilize the base layer to provide the services to the end user. Whether or not that's gonna be the case, we'll, we'll see. But the point is OpenAI might not wanna be targeting the end consumer across all industries. Seems like they might target some big ones in the healthcare, maybe finance, customer service, but there might be many where these services are needed, but where OpenAI just might not have the resources and the bandwidth to pursue. What if you need it for education or things like gaming, maybe some sort of a mental health application, a psychologist on demand powered by your favorite large language model? Whatever OpenAI doesn't pursue would create an opening for other companies like Murati's Venture, and those smaller companies could become the new leaders in AI innovation in those spaces. But let me ask you, what do you think? What do you think of uh, Mira Murati's idea of, if these uh, articles and sources are to be believed, the idea of building AI products based on proprietary models? So proprietary models for specific applications, for specific companies. Do you think it's a good idea? Certainly as someone that's kind of in the center of all this, Mira Murati probably saw a lot of what's going on. So the fact that she chose to do this particular thing seems to indicate that 
that's what she sees as a massive, massive opportunity. And certainly for me, I've been saying that over the next decade or so, we're going to be sticking LMs into everything. It's going to be in your car, your computer, for sure, but also probably your thermostat, maybe your coffee maker and fridge and just everything. And many of them will require these custom proprietary models. And the people that will provide those services will likely become the new billionaires and Heck, maybe we'll even see a trillionaire emerge out of this. With that said, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.